Hi, everybody. Welcome back. This is Joni Stahl. Oh, it's so good to be back today. I am really glad to be here. I hope everybody is doing good today. I, uh, well, before I get started, I want to welcome everybody back again. And I want to thank you to give a thank you to all the new subscribers and everybody that supports this little green pasture. I just love this little green pasture so much, you guys. You just have no idea what it means to me and how much you all mean to me. And I'm always super happy. Like, I just look so forward to it. I'm, not, I'm really a spring-loaded person when it comes to this little green pasture where the chief shepherd dwells. Well, I am going to pray, and I am going to invite the Lord into this. And um, because he spoke to me very clearly today, uh, I I was going to teach one thing and it veined off into another. And I heard his voice so clearly into me, speaking in me what he wants me to tell you. So before I get started, I want to honor Jesus Christ with the acknowledgement that this is all of him and that we are all of his and we are here because of him. Dear Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning, and Lord, I personally just want to bow, and I want to bow low before you. I come before you, Lord Jesus, because I, I, I love you so much. You are my every thought. You are my every beat of my heart. You are everything to me, Lord, and I know I have the hearts of other people that are listening to this prayer that are saying, yes, Lord, me too, Lord, me too. And Lord, we are all come together just like Cornelius said to Peter when Peter came to his house and he said, we are all here together today to hear what God has to say through you. It was something like that. And Jesus, I may only be a vessel, but I give this vessel over to you for the purpose and display of your mighty power, of your wonderful love of your healing, your refreshing spirit, your, your presence. I pray for your presence by virtue of your Holy Spirit to overshadow me and overshadow all them that love you. Bless this message, Holy Spirit, and sanctify it and bless it. To the glory of Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going to get started. As I was saying, um, I had no idea really what I was going to teach. Yesterday, I thought of this word that I had read in Ezekiel 41.7. And I remember years and years ago, when I was reading it, and this is the chapter in Ezekiel, chapters 41, 42, 43, 44. Like it's the description of the interior and exterior of the millennial sanctuary. And so it's Ezekiel giving all, you know, um, in those portions of scripture throughout those chapters are written every detail about how it's going to be built on the outside, the inside, all that. But there was this one particular one that caught my eye a long time ago, and it goes like this. And there was, it's Ezekiel 41, 7. And there was an enlarging and a winding about still upward to the side chambers, for the winding about of the house went still upward round about the house. Therefore, the breadth of the house was still upward and so increased from the lowest chamber to the highest of the midst. Three times it says, it talks about the temple that goes upward. It speaks about it still upward, still upward, still upward. And I remember years ago reading that. And I want to share a dream very quickly that I had. Many of you have heard it, but I like resharing things for the purpose of what God showed me and let it speak to you. 
but I remember I had this dream. And when I had this dream, it was when not long afterwards, I saw this scripture and, and it really spoke to me. So my dream started out where I was with a little group of people. I don't know, maybe eight or nine of us. It was very small. And we were all together walking together on a very narrow, little, rocky, tiny little road. It looked like it was up in the country and it went the road. You, and I knew in my dream that it went up and down. You know, like you would see, like if you go hiking, like in the in the hill countries around, in the hill country around you, around where you live. So the dream starts with all of a sudden I'm in the front. I just so happened to be in the front. I wasn't leading anybody. I'm just saying I was in the front. All of a sudden I said, stop. Like I went like this with my arms. I was like, stop. Because I saw that the little rock, I mean, it was like, it was so small. It was like single file and there was rocks in it. And it wasn't an easy road to walk on. I want to make that clear. It was not an easy road to walk on. You had to watch your every step or you'll twist your ankle or or it, and then it was, there was a, I mean, even where we stopped, there was a sheer side to it where if you took one, if you fell, you could fall very badly down below. So I went like this. I stopped because I looked ahead and I saw that the little road went steep down, but it went into two different directions. So I stopped because I thought, which way are we supposed to go? As soon as I said that, I saw something in front of me and just up ahead of me a little bit by maybe like 10 feet, like I saw, maybe not even that far, but I looked down on the ground and I saw a string with little pearls, but not like a string of pearls. I could see that a pearl was every so often, like it was like a breadcrumb trail, but it was on a string and it was a pearl per however many feet. But you had to keep your eye on that string of pearls. And I, but at first I was like, what does that mean? And I said, wait here while I go look. So I went down and I'm looking like this, like my eyes are on this string. And so I saw when I got to the fork that the string of pearls went to the right. So I thought, I wonder what this means. I wonder if somebody has been lost and they want us to find them. And maybe this is where it leads to maybe a person say who's lost and then I can find them and help them. So as I went off to the right, I noticed that the road became even narrower, but now both sides, there was a sheer, sheer drop off on either side. As I went, I looked and I saw down below in a chasm, it looked like a car that had flown off. Like, I don't, I mean, this was a little tiny, narrow single file road. Like how a car got down there, I don't know, just put the pieces together as I tell it. I don't want to interpret as I go along. It'll interpret itself. And I see a car like it had flown off that into that chasm a long time ago because it was like an old rustic car. Like nobody knew whoever fell down there was down there. And I said to myself, oh, no, there's somebody down there, a car. But, you know, we've all seen pictures of cars that have been down in a pit somewhere where you're like, oh, that's been there for 20 years, you know, like rusted. It's long, long ago. And I saw like a figure, like a silhouette of a person sitting in the driver's seat. And I said to myself, there's a person in there. They need help. But they're, they were it was as black as my shirt. Like the silhouette was as black as my shirt. And the car was even kind of is as black nearly as my shirt. And I knew it was too late that whoever was in that car, it was too late, but I was compelled to keep going. So I kept going and the whole way I'm looking down and every so often there was a pearl. I'm not saying every 10 feet, it was just every so often it was irregular. It wasn't perfect at the, and finally I'm, I'm walking and I, and I saw that the string ended and there was a pearl at, you know, tied at the end of it, like it was at the end. And I thought, okay. And I looked up, but I looked, um, it was kind of slightly down, but I saw this big, vast area. And in that, I saw what looked like a big palace. I was like, what is this? But I could see all these people, but I knew that the people didn't live there. I, it was like 
whoever lived in that palace, it was moving day for them because they were moving into it. And I could see all these people, like as if they were hired people, like carrying boxes in. And you know what I mean? Like there was this hustle and bustle of you would, you know how it is when you see people moving in, there's hustle and bustle. And I was like, whoa. And I wanted to get a better look at this house. And so I remember, oh, and by the way, it's very important for me to say that when I got to the end of that string of pearls, and as I stood there looking out, it was then that I felt that man with me. That's always with me in my dreams. He was with me on my right side. He's always on my right side, which I believe is a good sign. <laughs> anyway, so I knew that he wanted me to go look because I was so curious who is moving into this house, this palace. But I didn't see how really big it was. I just knew it was big. And as a dream went on, it enlarged itself. So I get to the front door. And as soon as I got the front door, it was these enormous big double doors. And all of a sudden, this door opens up and there's a person that came out. And the person uh, looked up at me with kind of like a look like this, but but full of joy. And the person said to me, you're a king. And I go, what? I'm not a king. What are you talking about? I'm no king. And he goes, oh, no, you're a king. And I said, no, I'm not a king. He said, yes, you are. I go, this is so dumb. But I go, well, if I'm a king, how, and I, I think I did it just to be kind of like, not, not too nice, but like, I said, well, if I'm a king, why aren't you bowing to me? And he laughed and walked away. And then, of course, I felt silly for saying that, like, okay, you know, and then um, the man that I was with opened the door. And as we walked in, it was this hall that was so great. It was so big. And it was like all these, this beautiful floor. And in the distance was like this little throne and no one was sitting on it. So whoever was moving in, that, that was, this was theirs. Okay. And so I was like, so curious, but um, when I walked in and I was looking around, I mean, I, I if I, I'm not really good with like feet, like I can't say, well, it was as big as a football field. I can't say that. All I know is it was palatial. It was beyond enormous and gore and beautiful. And I can't really even describe the beauty of it. And I don't want to get lost in detail. So let me keep going because I could see it in my mind, but it doesn't matter. So, um, I said to myself, I want to see what, I want to see more of this as I, because I was saying it to myself, as I said that I heard to my left something coming and I looked and I saw a hallway and you know, in big palaces, they don't have like little hallways like you'd have an apartment, you know, where two people can't pass. Um, but the hallways are grand. And I looked and I saw this hallway and I noticed that it was like a ramp going up, like it just went up, but it's circle. And I could see part of it, like it was circling up, but I saw, I heard something coming. And so I went to go see what was coming and I saw what looked like a troop of an angelic host. And I saw them and they were walking in um, perfect rank um, they had on some kind of clothing. Everything was white. I'm not going to get into description like, oh, look like this, look like that. It doesn't matter. But I will tell you, they had a distinct, distinct clothing on and they all wore the same thing. Um, and they were perfectly focused and every one of them marched in perfect unison and focus. And so, uh, you know, me being this overzealous, um, cause you know me, I can, I can be pretty bold with things, you know, but, um, I think I was really allowed very much just to be my human self in this dream. And so I said, I'm going to march with them. And so I went to go join them to march with them. And all of a sudden a door opened up and another man came out and the man you could see was very, was wearing absolutely different clothes than those angelic hosts. 
And I don't know what kind of man this was, but you could see he was very decorated. Um, he was very distinguished looking. He had white hair. I, I can't tell you what his face looked like, but that white hair wouldn't be like old age as we see it. I took it that he was somebody of some stature in heaven or may, I don't even know, how, and forgive me for the usage of words. Um, it's hard to describe spiritually it, when you're awake, what is seen. And he came out and I, I mean, I do remember he wore beautiful clothes and he did have some kind of a sash thing on. But anyways, he came to me and he said, stop, don't do it. Don't do that. And I go, okay. And he said, follow me. And so, I mean, I was at peace with him. He wasn't mad at me, um, but there was something happening that demanded my focus and my attention that I was brought there for a certain reason, you know, and of course, I don't know what it is, but I noticed that as we were going, we were going, we were winding up. There were no stairs, but it was a winding and it was going up and up. And I knew that I thought, where are we going? They we're like winding up. And, but I knew that as I was going, I, I can, I put it this way. I felt an authority coming within me. Um, it was no earthly authority. Like we would go, man, I'm going to take authority. I'm going to do this. It wasn't like that. It was entering into me as I was going. And then he opens a door and he goes in first and he throws open these shutters or blinds or he some windows there because there was no blinds there was no shutters but somehow he just like opened everything up <clears throat> <clears throat> while he was opening everything up i looked behind me like you see a door behind me just like that there was a door behind me and the door was open there was nothing in the room it was completely empty so <clears throat> while he was doing things in that room I looked behind me because I saw something. I saw a little box. It was like a little box this big. And it was in that little room unopened. And it was an empty room. So when he was done, I looked because I because I looked back and saw that he was done. And I saw that these doors were open. And there was this big, big patio, I guess, or bal I'll say balcony. And he was, and he, and I walked out and I stood there and I was looking out and he, he turned and walked away. He just left. Like whatever he was to do was done. He turns, he doesn't say goodbye. He just leaves. And all of a sudden I am amazed. I am looking out at this land. I'm like, what kind of land is this? I've never seen land like this before. And I can't believe how far I can see. Like I was in amazement. Like my eyes were like, like I can't, I've never seen this far before. And they were green rolling hills. And there was this liquid golden sunlight that was all spread out all over everything. And everything was pristine, like the most beautiful spring slash summer day, like pristine beauty. As I was marveling in it, all of a sudden, I saw a man walk to the left of me. And I looked and and and, I, and as I was standing there, it was important to say this. As I was standing there, I felt that that everything, that authority of, I'll just say authority. And I want to be careful with that word because... That's, but all I can say, it's such as this power came in of authority, like command, um, like completeness, maturity, something. I don't know. I'm just trying to be sensitive to the words I use. And I look at the man and I felt solid. And I said to him, who are you and what is your occupation? Like, I don't know even why I said that, but that authority came out, that spirit, you know. I said, who are you and what is your occupation? And he said to me, and he kind of slightly, he was very calm, but I noticed that, let me tell you before I say this, because I got to tell you what he looked like. I can't tell you what his face looked like, but I can honestly tell you that he was the most decorated person in the whole place. 
that there was no one like him. And he said, I am, what did he say? I am a shepherd and a gatherer of clay. I believe that's what he said. And I said, and right then I knew it was Jesus. And right when he said that, I looked over. I don't know why, but I was compelled to look over my shoulder in that little room. And all of a sudden, I saw a little cup, a little golden cup. Nothing special. It was gold, but it was sitting on top of the box. And I looked back at him, and he said, very soon, you will be drinking the cu that cup with me in my kingdom. I woke up. And it was not long after that I read Ezekiel 41.7. Now, I said all of that because today, while I was getting ready to do this message, I began to hear Jesus speak to me. I was thinking, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, because I did fully pray. I was like, Lord, tell me what you want me to say to these people. You know, I mean, I pour it out, you guys. I really, really do. I want you to know that it's so important for me to tell you that I do that. Because I want what is from him. I don't want any cheap substitutes. I don't want any um, concession, something concessionary like, well, I'll just add this. But it's like, no, I need to hear from you. What do you have to say from your heart into mine? What is on your heart, Jesus? And I was really pouring it out to Jesus today. And uh, so when that was brought to my mind, the still upward, still upward, and that dream that I had, um, I started to, I said, okay, I'm going to start building on it. So I do admit that this was now myself. So I started thinking of, you know, yes, Lord, everything that has to do with you is upward. Your call is the upward. You know, when he says, brethren, I can't count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to the things which are before ever, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And, you know, in the new revised standard, it says the upward call. So my mind started to think of all these places about the going upward and the mountain of God and how Jesus always went up to the mountain. He prayed and then he would go up to the mountain. He'd call his disciples to expound things more greatly to them. And, you know, there's all these references to Mount Sinai and Mount Hermon were, uh, Joshua, I mean, uh, where David says, you know, he was having a down moment, you know, and he was saying, I will remember thee from Mount Jordan and the hill Mazar. And, you know, and as I was putting these together, I was talking to the Lord in my spirit. And I said, Lord, I said, I, because I, I was reading through his word. This was after devotions. And, um, and I said, Lord, I can, no, this was during devotions. I'm sorry, you guys, but I was preparing because when I do devotions, I'm also, you know, <laughs> casting my line in and I'm fishing to see what he wants me to say to you guys and what he wants to say to me. And I said to him, I said, Lord, let me read your word today. Let me read your word today, not as just seeing it, not just reading it, but let me see it. It is the living water. And then I felt, and the Lord was, don't you have days where he just really speaks to you? And all of a sudden, um, I got this image of water, right? Like I just had this image of water, like just looking down, looking down at water, beautiful, like a river of water, right? And and I felt the Lord say to me, yes, but you can look under the water because the water can go as deep, as deep, as deep as it can go. You can look below the water. The word is like my is like waters that are deep. You can remain on the surface of my waters but you can go deep into the waters as deep as you want to go. And I thought about Ezekiel, Ezekiel 48, how he talks about the river of God, how we went into his ankles, how he went into his waist. And then it said they were rivers to swim in. And I felt like the Lord was saying to me, I'll take, you can go as deep as you want to go. And then he began to speak even more because as I, like I know, let me get back to what I was saying, because I was thinking of all these scriptures. Oh, I could look up this scripture and I could, over, I could look up at this scripture. And the Lord brought me back to something, what I read in devotions. And I felt him saying, I don't want you to look up a bunch of scriptures about Mount Zion on the sides of the north or about how uh, in Jerusalem, 
you know, will be the place where the great king is and all nations will flow up to the mount, you know. He said, not today. I mean, I'm telling you guys the truth. I heard him saying, no, the great shepherd of the sheep. He told, I'm telling you, I could hear him. I'm, I, I am purposely being emphatic and I am careful. I would never come to you guys and say, the Lord said, if he didn't say it, I'm telling you, I might say, I get a sense. I think I might be hearing, but I'm telling you, I was hearing his voice like you are hearing mine. I feel so moved right now, but he said these words to me. I don't wa want you to overfeed them. I want you to lead them to me. And then he said, go back to what you read today in your devotions. And the last thing I, one of the last things I read is in Psalm 78, 70 through 71. And he chose David also his servant and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the ewes great with young. He brought him to feed Jacob, his people, Israel, his inheritance. And the Lord said these words to me. My people are, are, well, let me, fit, I, before I say this, just hold on, because it's important. Please have patience with me, I'm human. But I want to get it right so you hear it exactly how I heard Jesus tell me. If you're familiar with the story of Jacob and Esau, remember their terrible breakup. I don't want to get into it. You can read that on your own. But there was a day many years later where it was time for them to meet and make up. And uh, it was a good meeting and they did make up. And when a time came for them to go their separate ways, Esau said, you know, why don't you come with me? And, you know, and Jacob had given him a bunch of cattle and, um, and this is what was said in Genesis 33, 13 through 14. And he said to him, my Lord knoweth that the children are tender and the flocks and herds with young are with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant and I will lead on softly according as the cattle that goeth before me and the children be able to endure until I come unto my Lord, unto Sire. The Lord brought that to my attention. And he says, now this is what the Lord said to me. And I'm going to tell you. He said, I don't want you to overdrive them. He said, my people are so overdriven. All they hear is how to do this, how to do that. Just lead them to me. Let me be their shepherd. Tell them, I see that they are starving, but I am the one that will feed them. He said, and then he started showing me things where people brought their sick to him, where this, or they brought their demon possessed to him. Or when he says, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. The Lord was telling me, all they hear all day long, my people, all they hear all day long are religious steps on how to hear me, how to serve me, what to do, where to go, step by step, this and that. He said, I don't, I, he said my people are falling down. My people have fallen down right before me because there are other shepherds that are overdriving them. They are overdriven. They are being, there's people, you guys, I know I hear some from some people. I know people that say, you know, I just want to hear him. I feel like if I read more, if I do more, if I do more, Jesus doesn't want you to do more. He doesn't want you to do more. And that's hard for the postmodern Christian. The postmodern Christian thinks there has to be more. Therefore, I must do more. And I'm going to go an extra mile. I'm going to stay up an hour later. I'm going to drink a cup of coffee to force myself to stay awake. 
you know, you can overdrive yourself. You know, look what it says. If men should overdrive them in one day, all the flock will die. That is what Jesus is seeing. He is more interested right now in you knowing that he sees that you are tired, even religiously tired, and he's sick of it. He is sick of it. We serve a great shepherd. He is ever more the great shepherd today in your life. He will lead you on and never overdrive you. He you know, look at what it says. Even the cattle. You know, when you think about the man God chose, he chose a boy who's out there with cattle. It says that he was following the use great with young. Think about the heart of God towards you. Think about the heart of God towards you. He is your great shepherd. He's not just didn't die on the cross and then he's in heaven and now everybody carry on. You go here, you go there, you do this, you do that. And you know, some might say, well, we're to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Yeah, but don't overdrive yourself. You know what happens when you overdrive yourself? You die. It says that the... David was following the use great with young. The use great with young, those are sheep getting ready to give birth. They can barely walk. Think of that tender heart while he's watching them. Get an image in your mind. Picture it. Stop reading your Bible so fast. Stop. Slow down. Look at it. Could you imagine that heart of David? He was no religious man. He wasn't in some altar he built somewhere. Well, I got to be with them. I, I got to know the, alt, the sheep great with young. Don't but he was tender hearted. It said he chose David. He chose him his servant and took him from the sheep folds from following the ewes great with young. He brought him to feed Jacob, his people and Israel, his inheritance. And you know, this is the heart that was after God because you see God's tender hearted. You know, so many of you, you know, you think, you know, your faith, you know, your faith is not strong enough to, to get up and follow the shepherd. But you know, even when your faith sleeps, Christ is awake. There's going to be times where you cannot endure. You have a chief shepherd. He doesn't drive with a whip. He leads with staff and rod. And here's another thing. Isaiah 40, verse 11. He shall feed his flock. Now, here's four things. One, two, three, four. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm. And carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. See, the Lord was saying to me, my people are so overburdened with religious tasks, with accumulating knowledge. I was speaking to a good friend of mine who is up in years a wonderful apologist. And he was saying to me, my gosh, I was listening to this. And I was listening to that. He lives alone. You know, sometimes, you know, he wants to see what's going on. And he was saying, yeah, but this theologian is saying this. And these guys are saying that about these and, and splitting hairs about this and that. And I said, and he, and he was so frustrated, not well, he was frustrated sounding and he sounded exhausted. I said, Hey, listen, stop, stop it. This is the very thing that becomes the burdens. We think burdens have to do with, well, I have an angry husband. It's such a burden. Oh, I have this mean boss. It's such a burden. And yeah, they're, they're burdens. Those are burdens. But there are religious burdens you are carrying. It's time to offload them. Because the Lord has, is see, I, I, I heard him clearly say, don't feed them anymore. 
stop right now. Today, I want you to tell them, I see my people all over the world. They're exhausted. They are tired. They are trying to keep up. They are trying, 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 but they're fallen down. God's people are fallen down under the weight of religious circus acts, false prophecies, thinking that they have to understand and split hairs over things. The Lord is saying to me, not right this moment, but this morning, that's that's not what I want from them. They're being overdriven. You know, that's still upward, still upward, still upward. I think that there's a trust issue with the Lord, with a lot of people. I'm just going to be honest. This may speak to you. you. You may have lived a life where in your house you had to earn love. Uh, you may feel that where how you lived or grew up, something hurt you. Where you felt like you had no value. That there was no worth. And though you can say, no, I know Jesus loves me. Um, that's not been a revelation to you yet. Because when you, by the spirit of wisdom and revelation, have your eyes of your understanding open to that knowledge of God, that his love for you before he laid the foundations and the, the you know, the foundations of the earth, he loved you. He loved you, and he's not going to change his mind. He will never change his mind about you. And in this life, God wants, see, he sees, he knows that you're fallen under the burden of earning. He wants you to know today that he is there for you He's here right now. And that temple, the enlarging and winding still upward, still upward, still upward. You see, because this rotten, demon-infested world, yet there's good in it too, right? The earth, O Lord, is full of thy goodness. The earth, O Lord, is full of thy mercy. But that burden of overeating and overdriving is killing you. I had a friend. I still have a friend. I just don't, you know, she's off in her life doing things. We're still friends. But no matter how, every time I saw her, she would say to me, oh, Joni, oh, Joni, I said, I said, I a bad word slipped out. I slipped out. Am I going to hell? I, and I would just painstakingly take time and say, no, you're not going to hell. Are you sorry for it? Of course, I'm sorry for it. I was begging God to forgive me. I'm like, well, you don't have to beg God. You just have to ask him. And in the moment you ask him, he forgives you. Oh, good. Oh, good. So I'm going to heaven. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure you probably are. I, why wouldn't you? I mean, you are born again. Okay. That's a demonstration of every single time, every single time this poor woman and probably still to this day, I hope not, but I've known her for a long time lives on this edge of fear that one day, I, you know, I did something wrong and now I cannot enter in. See, it is a trust issue because postmodern church, and it's been ingrained through the centuries, you got to go to church, you got to do this, you got to do that. But I'll tell you something if you're truly alive in Christ, and after so long a time, you realize that all those religious acrobats, you know, back handsprings, um, double torques, you know, all these things never bring you closer to Christ. You know, Jesus says, draw near unto me. And some of you say, but what does that mean? You know, haven't you ever been driving in your car and all of a sudden you start thinking about Jesus? You're drawing near to him. It's not somewhere where you got to tell everybody, I'm going to be alone with the Lord. Don't anybody come in here. No. 
that's still upward and still upward, that no matter who you are in this world, it's an upward call. And everything that Christ is doing in you is not over is not to overdrive you. I think we try to get God to follow us. The only thing that says he'll follow us is his goodness and mercy all the days of our life, but he doesn't follow us. I guess you can say in a sense, but it never says he follows us. It says that he leads us. You know, I saw, I wish I had it with me. Anyway, I saw this poem and it just so happened to be something I read today. And it says, and I want to read this poem to you, okay? And then I'm going to close because I want to keep this, uh, not, to, not even that I'm trying to keep it shorter because if I feel like there's more to say, I'm going to say it. Still upward be thine onward course for this I pray today still upward as the years go by and seasons pass away still upward in this coming year thy path is all untried still upward mayst thou journey on close by thy Savior's side still upward even though sorrow come and trials crush thine heart still upward May they draw thy soul with Christ to walk apart. Still upward till the day shall break and shadows all have flown. Still upward till heaven you wake and stand before his throne. C.S. Spurgeon said in a little thing he wrote, I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I pray till heaven I found, Lord, lead me to higher ground. Let God lead you today, okay? Will you? Will you let Jesus just lead you? Stop trying to keep up with the spiritual Joneses. Put away <clears throat> endless things, studies. I'm not against study, but there comes a time where your studies drive you far away from Jesus. And your heart gets cold and you become uh, touchy. Uh, and you want to start defending, you know, the word and this and that. It's like, it's not what Jesus wants for you today and tomorrow and the day after. You're going home to heaven one day, still upward, still upward, still upward, because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And everything that is Christ tends upward. And lastly, lastly, I watched a little video someone sent to me of a young man who saw um, he was a Christian, is a Christian. Um, and he said that he compromised one night that he had been with a group of people. I guess they were kind of partying and he he let, he let go of, you know, he compromised. I guess I could read it to you. You don't mind, do you? I think it's really good. He said that night after he compromised, he went to bed. He said that night I had a vision from the Lord. When he first showed up, I didn't even know who it was. My conscience was burning. I was tor I was in torment in the darkness. I saw a man step out of the shadows and stand right in front of me, looking me dead in the eyes. His hairline was deep and his features were very pronounced. And as I looked at him, I knew this man. I knew that he was the smartest man, most intelligent and wise person that ever existed. I knew that he had authority like no one had ever had authority before. As I looked at him, I knew that I was looking at the most powerful man that ever existed. And yet he was so gentle and he wasn't assuming. It was almost like you had just entered into a courtroom and the judge just looks like anybody, 
anybody else that you might have seen on the street, but you knew his position and that his role and what his role was. You knew that he couldn't be fooled. This guy doesn't seem proud or arrogant or anything like that. In fact, he seems very humble, and yet you know that he has complete control over your life. It was only after I started to gather all these attributes of this person that I was looking at that I made the connection and realized who he was. And I realized that I was looking at Jesus, and I realized that Jesus was looking at me. And there was a disappointment in his eyes. There was a sadness in his eyes. He just sat there looking at me and he lifted up his hand and above his hand, I saw the world and it wasn't a model of the world. I knew that when I saw it, it was the actual world. It was so three dimensional and it was spinning slowly over his hand, but he never looked at it. He kept looking at me and without saying any words with his mouth, I could hear what he was thinking as the world turned to dust and it blew away. Before a speck of dust could hit his hand, I could see these tiny little souls, tiny, tiny little souls, just a few fall into his hand. And he started to close his hand around them. And he said, I am taking what's mine and it will all be over. I was so terrified in that moment because I knew that he was saying, I'm not playing any more games with you. You know better by now. You know that this world is dust and that the only reason it exists is for the harvest of souls that I'm going to take out of, out of it. You know it was a love of God to say those things to me. It was love for him to show me, to show me that. It was love for him to make me feel grieved for a moment so that I could snap out of it and realize that I could not play with that fire anymore. There will come a time when either you will go to him or he is coming to us. Either way, we will all stand before Jesus, the judge of the living and, in, and of the dead. He came to serve and to save the lost. He is worthy to be crowned king of kings and lord of lords. When you look at Jesus, you know everything good you have is from him and because of his mercy. There is no good people. No one is innocent. We all need that perfect spotless lamb of God and a sacrifice for us to stand before God. You know what I believe my calling is? Is to lead you to the great shepherd of the sheep. I know. I'm convinced of it. And today I lead you to him. I turn you over to him because I trust him with your life as I trust my own with his. I pray that today, it's not that you'll just take a day off, but that you'll stop letting yourself be overdriven by endless doctrines Endless this, endless that. Because right now, Jesus sees your weakness. He sees that you've been overdriven. And he wants to lead you. Not today, not tomorrow, but for the rest of your life. All the way home into heaven land. That's what I'm supposed to tell you today. And that is what I'm supposed to do today to lead you to the great shepherd of the sheep. And I will continue to do that. And today I've delivered the message. Now you go to him and you remain with him and you cleave to him and he will never overdrive you. Shalom.